So this is a decision that is made by the publishing companies in each of these countries. So it was uh, the original deal was done with an American publisher and this red and black cover with the uh, cartoon of Kim Jong-un yes. on the front, that is the main cover that's in many of the editions around the world. But the UK publisher thought that um, it need, they needed something more serious for mm -hmm. the British market, so that's why there is the photo on the cover there. It's just a marketing decision in each country. Uh, but when it comes to South Korea, uh, the publisher was concerned if the title was We De Han Ke Sung Da that people would get the wrong impression about the book because this is not a book that is kind to Kim Jong Un. You know, I have laid out just how brutal he has been to become the leader. But I called the book The Great Successor because those are words that North Korea used for Kim Jong-un. So I have used those words a little bit sarcastically in the title. But maybe that would be lost in Korean if it was We De Han. I do not agree with that. I think it's the exact opposite. I think Kim Jong-un discovered when he was in Switzerland that if it was not for this family system, if it was not for the mythology around the Kims and everything, he would just be another normal person. He would not be special, he would not be a prince. So I think that Switzerland taught him, uh, far from opening up North Korea, that he needed to keep North Korea the way it was. He needed mm. to maintain the system because he would not be special if it wasn't for this bizarre personality cult that his family has founded. I think he was very concerned and thought that the Soviet Union had abandoned Cuba during the Cuban... It's on Cuba. Yeah, that's right. So that made him concerned that the Soviet Union would not uh, support him in time a time of crisis but also remember at that time it emerged that Park Chung-hee had also been pursuing a secret nuclear weapons program and Kim Il-sung suddenly saw that maybe he would be left as the only one on the peninsula without nuclear mm -hmm. weapons so there was a number of factors that made him want to pursue them you know we saw the first tests under Kim Jong-il and they were very crude um, nuclear devices uh, but under Kim Jong-un, they've made so much progress to the point where they have demonstrated a hydrogen bomb capability. And Kim Jong-un needs this uh, partly for his domestic reasons. He needs to be able to instill a sense of national pride in North Koreans and also to maybe placate the military hardliners uh, in the regime. But it also has a very strong external message uh, we've seen the United States, President Trump, threaten to rain down fire and fury on yes. North Korea, while having a credible nuclear deterrent will, uh, you know, could fend that off. So he feels he needs it for his security. Yeah. No, I do not believe he will ever give them up. Even he, some part of it? No, he may give up some part of it, but he will never relinquish the capability to make war or to uh, keep the capability in the future to develop a nuclear program. I can see a process as part of these diplomatic talks where he might give up some fissile material or some hardware, but he will continue to retain the capability to make more. North Korea has always said, and I believe this is really true, that their nuclear program is for defense. It is not an offensive Offense. program, yeah. Because they know that if they were to use their nuclear weapons offensively, first mm -hmm. strike against the United States or the United States' allies in Asia, South Korea and Japan, that they would be met with an overwhelming American response. It would be suicidal for him to use that weapons program first. So no, I can't see a situation where he would move first and where Japan or South Korea would be in the firing line. Mm -hmm. 
either he's a very unhealthy person, he is at risk of diabetes, maybe heart attack, heart issues. Uh, we know that he disappeared from view in 2014, weeks, yes. mm -hmm. yeah, for six weeks and returned with a cane. So he's, uh, he's not in good health for somebody who's 35 years old. Uh, you know, it's possible Kim Jong-un could stay in power for decades to come and keep a hold on the system. It's also possible that there could be a faction, a military coup, uh, you know, military will rise up and topple him. We, we've seen that happen in a bunch of other countries recently, including Zimbabwe. Yes. Um, you know, the Arab Spring was happening in the year that Kim Jong-un was taking Scary. over. <laughs> yeah, Muammar Gaddafi was pulled from a ditch two months before Kim Jong-un took over. So I I think all of these examples are the kinds of things that would keep him up at night and would certainly be worrying him. If President Trump could get a victory, uh, something tangible, something that's not vague like the Singapore summit agreement was, he could use that as a big talking point uh, for his re-election campaign. Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un continue to make very conciliatory noises about talks and they are both saying that they want to return to talks. So I think it is um, possible that we will see another meeting or some kind of progress on this in the next year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think it's good to talk. I mean, if there could be a peace treaty and a liaison office set up, that yes. would be big progress. I mean, it doesn't have to be denuclearization right now, but they could make big progress towards being able to talk more easily. Yeah, I know that there is a, a, there are a lot of South Koreans, younger South Koreans, who feel like North Korea is a different country from South Korea entirely and feel no sense of connection to North Koreans. North Koreans ask me the same nosy questions as South Koreans do when I'm yeah. there or make, they laugh at the same jokes or, you know, North Koreans are generally, you know, they are just like the rest of us. They are trying to make sure that their children get a good education and get a better life than they have had. So I think there are so many similarities between the people of North Korea and us in the outside world. And, you know, I hope, uh, you know, it's just completely random who ended up on which side of that line in 1953. Uh, so I would hope that um, South Koreans and Korean Americans can see more of the human side of North Korea and realize that there are 25 million people who are victims of Kim Jong-un every single day. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us.